Trust God when He is silent. Now, the nation of Israel had been enslaved for 400 years. For 400 years, these people had been building monuments, building stone in, in, in graves, tombs, massive today castles. For 400 years, they were treated about as horrible as a human being could, could be treated. But for 400 years, they cried literal tears to God to free them. For 400 years, that, that's so many different generations, so much death. But the majority of them still stayed true to God because they knew sooner or later God was going to do what He said. And a lot of them would look at it like this as well. At least my family's together. At least we're, we're fed. At least we can celebrate our God. And they were allowed to do that. Um, at least we can pray to our God. And they were allowed to do that. For 400 years of crying out to God, as generation and generation hoped their children and grandchildren would one day know the sweet blessings of what it felt like to actually be free. Now, in, in theological terms, this phase of history in Israel is called God's silent years. That, that's the literal name for it. It's called the silent years of God. <clears throat> God was silent during this time. And this morning, I'm going to ask you, have you ever had any silent years or days of God? Have you begged God? Have you cried out to God? Have you mourned because you needed God's guidance, His help? You needed to hear His voice. You needed to feel that feeling that God is with you. God's going to take care of you. He's going to fulfill the promises and, and the obligations that He's promised you in your prayer but also in the Bible and throughout history. God will finish what He started. Had there been a time when you prayed in your prayer closet, in your private place, and you fervently sought God just to have Him remain silent and not give you any answers when you wanted them? Are you in the midst of praying through any storm of life waiting for God to guide you today? Are you waiting for God to give you an answer on something you've been dealing with today? In this place, it's easy to believe all the lies that are around you. That you're forgotten by God, you're abandoned by God. It's easy to turn your TV on and look at all these influencers around the world flourishing financially. Flourishing with the most beautiful women or the most handsome men. <laughs> The second most handsome men. <laughs> hey, wait. Okay, I don't know what an influence is, or, and, and I'm not one, but my TikTok just hit 100,000 followers this morning. That's pretty good. At Pastor John Collins. <laughs> the enemy wants you to think that God's not listening to you. The enemy wants you to think that there's better things in life. And believe it or not, your enemy can be family members or friends. Oh, come on, one more drink. Come on, one more, one more high. It's not going to matter. Come on, one more night out. Your wife ain't going to know. Hey, we ride to die, baby. We're together. Staff is going to happen outside of what's going on tonight. Nobody's ever going to know. You guys know all those friends? Those friends that's got your back that are going to take you straight to hell? Everybody's got one of those friends. I got advice for you today about those friends. Get as far away from Charlie, I mean, as your friends as you can get. Get as far away from those evil influencers of your life. We have a lot of children that attend this church. We had a lot of them have birthdays a couple days ago, last week. You know, they're, they're 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Would you want your children influenced by the people that you're hanging around with today? Because if you don't, I got a news flash for you, Jack. They are being influenced because they listen to everything. They see everything. A child's intuition is a lot better than you think it is. And then, by the way, when your child gets to be 15 and becomes rebellious 
and wants nothing to do with you and cusses and is abuser and smoking pot every day and drinks and the grades in school are bad. He wants to get kicked out. Don't blame that 15-year-old. You're the one that raised him. It's your fault. The same way it is with the Israelites. If they stay true with God, God will see you to the promised land. God's heard your cries. He heard the cries of the Israelites. The Lord said in Exodus 3, 7, 8, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land. Now, following God when He doesn't answer your prayers sometimes when you pray, God moves and the situation instantly moves. In these moments, it's easy to know that God's on your side, that He's in control of everything you're doing. Then your faith is strengthened and your praise to God continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. But what if God is silent or your prayers go unanswered for just a little bit? What do you do when things seemingly go from bad to worse? It's not on your time frame. It's not happening the way you want it. Does that mean that God's not at work in your life and that sometimes the plans He said are, thwart or, or, are washed away and other plans that you had are going to be taken from you? No, it means exactly the opposite. If your faith is growing, growing, and growing, it's because God's got something a lot better for you in store. Now, here's the thing. If God gives you a timeline of something, rest assured that's going to happen. You've been blessed to hear what God's got to say and what God feels about you in your life. Amen? If God is making you wait a little bit, He's not making you wait to punish you. He's making you wait because He's going to provide more. He's going to give you abundantly more than what you asked for. As long as your faith stays strong. Have you ever had this one? I mean, I've been in a bad mood all week. I've just been in a bad mood. What if God was in a bad mood all week? What if God literally was in a bad mood over your life all week? What would happen? He would derail every single thing He ever promised you, wouldn't He? The Israelites were strong enough to know, even though they're seeing generation after generation after generation die, they knew that the prayers they were praying then, if it didn't lead them out of captivity, it was going to lead their sons and daughters or their grandchildren out of captivity. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. They stayed faithful. They stayed true. They became, listen to this, they became some of the most selfish people on this planet and this planet has ever seen. Because their thought process was this, I know there is only one true God. He's still on the throne. He was on the throne then with the Israelites. He's on the throne today with us. There's their, their thought process, there's only one true God. God, I will stay true to you. Protect our children. Protect our, our people, our community. Because I know one day, the prophecy is going to be fulfilled and we are going to be a free people. And they stayed true to that through everything they had to go through. From birth until death, they were slaves. They were slaves. You want to talk about slaves? They were slaves. The Israelite nation probably had the same questions. When Moses went to Pharaoh and relayed God's message that the people should be set free, the wicked ruler grew angry. See, we're all wicked rulers when we don't get our way. God didn't answer my prayer. Oh, it's always going to be this way. It's, all, it's the way it's always been. Nothing's ever going to change. It's always going to be this way. Nothing's ever going to change. We're stuck here, and that's just the way we have to deal with it. If that's what you think, guess what, friends? You're stuck there. That's the way it is, and nothing's ever going to change. Because that's your will for it. God's will is, I've got better plans for you. Your will is to sit on the pity pot and sulk and complain and whine. Me, 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 me. Why don't you do what the, Israel's, the Israelites did and worry more about your family, worry more about your kids and this generation and that generation than you. And then watch God bless you. 
Worry about everybody around you. This world's a mess. We can fix it. Exodus 5.23 Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, oh, let's go to Exodus 5.9. The Israelites most likely asked the same question when Moses went to Pharaoh. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and no pay no attention to lies. Continue to work. Now here's a big misconception in the Bible. The first part. Who in here thinks that the first thing that Moses said to Pharaoh was the Lord said, let my people be free. Let my people go. Anybody know that? You shall be wrong. It was to let them go to go worship. It wasn't to be completely free at that point. Let them go to worship. And then God's like, uh-huh, all right, I can play that game. I asked you to go let them worship. Now I'm telling you, you're going to free them. God is one of these gods. Don't tell me what to do, because I'll make it a hundred times worse for you. So they wanted to go free to worship. They wanted to go out in the wilderness to worship. But now they're going to get set free. Now they're going to get set free. Even Moses grew discouraged when he saw the increased workload placed on the nation of Israel. He cried out to God saying, Exodus 5.23, Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people. And you have not rescued your people at all. In these moments, it's natural to wonder what's going on with God. What's going on in God's mind? You question yourself. Did I miss what God said? Am I worshiping someone I shouldn't be worshiping? Should I go about and just live my life and let roll the dice and just see what comes out of it in the end? Did you fail to walk in His ways? Was your faith simply not enough to prompt Him to show up? Are you always complaining? Do you give praise where praise is needed? Remember what the Bible says, and this, I'm going to tell you something, this, this is straight on it. I've told Austin this, I've told several other people, and this is the God's truth. I'm afraid of God. I am absolutely afraid of God. Because the Bible says God's everything. He's omnipotent. It also says that God is a jealous God. God is everything. If God wanted me gone right now, before 1030 hit in 30 seconds, I would lay down here and be dead. That's the power God has. But if He wants to lift you up, in 30 seconds, you're lifted up. It's all on His shoulders. Treat Him well. He will treat you well. Amen? Following God when He tests your faith. The truth is that sometimes God uses opposition to His will to further His glory. This is how it is when God responds to Moses. He says, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Because of my mighty hand. Not because I picked Moses and Aaron. Not because I gave Moses a staff. Not because I liked them better. Because, see, as of right now, I've had enough. And when God's had enough, God's had enough. So he's telling Moses at this point, Come here, brother. I got to tell you something. <laughs> that old dog, Pharaoh, he's about ready to find out who's got the biggest bite. You go tell him, I said he's going to let my people go. Because if he doesn't, we're going to have a problem. Amen? We're going to have a problem. Pharaoh and God, now there's a problem. Now there's a problem. So often God turns a test of your faith into the testimony of how loving and how grateful God is. How, how good God is in your life. How He took you from nothing to everything. How He took you from obscurity to notoriety. How He built a rock into the Rocky Mountains. Because God can, he can literally do that, but He can figuratively do that in your life. He can take you from a pebble to the mountaintop. Just like that. 
just like that. He does this for His glory and honor to draw even more people to Him. God again. God is a jealous God. God wants all the praise and all the glory. But He's going to give you the reason to give Him all the praise and all the glory. He's just not going, praise me, praise me. He's saying, listen, I'm going to do this, and when I do it, I want you to tell everybody how good I am. Because I want everybody to come here one day to see me. I want everybody to show up at those gates, and I'm going to look at them, and instead of going, you're going the other way. I'm going to tell everybody at the gate, come on in, brothers. You were a good and faithful servant. You did well. You honored me. You glorified me. You may now enter. That's our goal. That's what we strive for. Amen? He also uses this opportunity to refine your character, to grow your faith. It's when your spirit is refined and tested by God, where God smooths out all the rough edges, strengthens your faith, and you'll find the end of yourself in your own plans. You find God ready to show what He has planned and how He'll grow in your process. But this doesn't mean the road is going to be painless. It doesn't mean the road is going to be smooth. It doesn't mean the road is going to be straight. It means the road is going to be bumpy. There's going to be curves. But listen, if you pass this test, if you pass this test, as long as your car has good suspension, you can let go of the steering wheel and just go forever because you're on smooth sailing from then on out until the day you die. You've protected you and your family by your faith, by what you've done. By everything that you've done to glorify God, God will reward you like He did the Israelites. He rewarded them for generations after generation. He indeed led them to the land of milk and honey. He led them to prosperity. He led them as soldiers fighting armies that were 10, 20, 30 times more than them. God led them to victory every single time based on their faith. So don't tell me that faith is irrelevant in today's life. Don't tell me that God ain't going to test us. Because go read the Bible, A, eh, all the way down. In the beginning to the end. It's a test of faith. It's God's glory. It's what He can do. It's our will. It's His Son. It's everything that we've ever needed in the greatest book to ever written to show us how to live our life and how to get favor with God. Right? Trusting God in chaos. After three plagues against both the Egyptians and Israelites, God made a bold declaration to Pharaoh saying, I will make a distinction <coughs> between my people and your people. The Israelites, the Israelite nation is spared the remaining seven plagues. It's a clear sign that God is protecting and be be defending His beloved people. See, they didn't get fire thrown down on them. They didn't get inundated with frogs and locusts. They just sat back and said, Pharaoh, we tried to tell you the power of our God. But you know what they didn't do too? They didn't go make fun of Him. They didn't mock Him. Because they also knew the power of God. So don't go mocking people. Go out and try to help them. To reassure them, as long as they go to the path that God take the, takes them, everything is going to be fine. The same thing God is saying over you today. Yes, you may suffer as God's work isn't always neat. It's sometimes messy. Sometimes you'll come into overwhelming situations. You may uh, ache and suffer as God restores and redeems you. You may go about your business the way that only you think your business should be going about. But I'm going to tell you something about God. I'm going to tell you something about God. Can I evangelize now? Because I don't like this pastor stuff. Not in me. The same God that took a stuttering man that gave his brother a prayer that said, meet him halfway. Don't worry about your stuttering. Don't worry about you think that you're not eloquent enough to serve me, to go take care of Pharaoh. You don't worry about you. That's for me to do. You let me worry about you. You just listen to what I say. Because if you listen to what I say, I will show you the greenest pasture you've ever seen in your life. I will give you the power that I have. You'll separate seas. You'll turn water into blood. You'll inundate that place with fire and locusts and frogs. You will be shown through my love, my mercy, and my grace on what God 
is capable of. You don't worry about you. You let me worry about you, and the rest is going to be fine. God is saying that today like he said it then. Get over your dang selves. Don't worry about yourself. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, how much money you have. If you're faithful to Almighty God, I promise you, as sure as I'm screaming up here, I'm going to lose my voice again. I promise you, God's going to provide ample for your food. God's going to provide financially everything, plus more abundantly than you've ever wanted. But it's based on those words, F-A-I-T-H. It's based on how much faith that you have in big G, big O, big D, because he's still on the throne. He still provides miracles. He's still healing people. He's still prophesying to people on this earth. He's still letting people evangelize. He's still trying to set the world straight. But we can't get over ourselves long enough. We can't get over us. We can't decide what God we want to serve. The worldly God or the one true God? If you continue to serve the worldly God, you're going to run into obstacles. You're going to run into obscure problems. That you, you're just going to sit and cry and bawl and wonder how in the world are you going to get out of this situation. The problem is you put yourself in it. There's an easy way not even to get in it. It's called faith. Your faith. If your faith is so strong, I believe this with all my heart. I don't care how sick your child is. I don't care how sick you are. There is nobody on this planet. There's nobody in this universe. There's nobody in, in anywhere that can tell me that if you're right with God, God is right with you. If you're right with God, you may go to bed with cancer, but you sure as heck ain't waking up with it. If your child is sick, if you're addicted to anything, you may go to bed with it, but if your faith is strong, you're not waking up with it. He will take it. Test your faith, but don't test God. There is a huge difference in that statement. Your faith has got to be strong enough that if you walked over to the river and you wanted to cross it, you could put down a staff and it would open. That's how strong your faith would be. But here's the problem with that. People will look at the river and go, there's no way. There is no way that's going to happen. Well, of course there's not because you don't believe that it's going to happen. You don't believe it. One thing, I know you guys are going to find this, what I'm getting ready to say, very difficult about me, and I'm being serious, to understand. <laughs> I'm shy. I, d I don't exhume a lot of uh, self-confidence. i tell you about me. I've never followed anybody other than Jesus Christ. I've never looked at any man walking this planet and thought, man, I want to be like them. That's the God's truth. I never have, except Jesus Christ. I don't necessarily do a lot of things, really. I only do what God allows me to do. I only succeed at what God tells me I can succeed in. But if he puts something in me to go do, aren't we all, aren't we all supposed to grab onto that and do the best we could do with it and make even God proud of it? If God gives us a, a task, aren't we supposed to abundantly go beyond that task to make God proud of us? Isn't our life's ambition right now is to save this crazy, mixed up, nutty world? Because it's a mess. It, it's like the Jiffy factory just put everybody in there and start swirling them around and going, oh, here's the next fruit. You know, we're, we're all a bunch of nuts. Well, I'm not. You guys are. I'm kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Most of the people are. They believe in everything that's thrown at them, every conspiracy theory. They believe that God doesn't exist. Here's the good one. The New England Institute last report was that only 40% of people in the United States of America believe that Jesus Christ was more than just a man. They don't believe He was uh, uh, any type of a prophet. And they don't believe that he was the Messiah. 
How can they go against archaeology now? Because it, it's more than proven in all the things they're finding. But because man's strong will, because we decide what we want to believe in, we decide what we don't want to believe in. We here, Here's a really good one. Matthew 5.17, you don't have that up there. Matthew 5.17 specifically states, Do not think I come here to change the laws of the prophets. I did not come here to change the laws. I came here to fulfill them. Leviticus, man shall not lay with man. Oh, that's only for the Old Testament. Read Matthew 5.17 for me one time. It's for all the Testament. It's for all the people. If it was a sin in the Old Testament, it's a sin in the New Testament, it's a sin today. Because the same God inspired man to write them down because that's how daggum important they were for him. Quit reading Scripture to make it what you want it to be. It's what God wanted it to be. It was then, it is now. Quit thinking you're God. That goes for people on the pulpit. Brothers, you're not God. Honestly, most of you are a bad imitation of a pastor. That's just being real. If you're up here, serve Him. But serve Him the right way with all of your heart, with complete faith. We will change this world. There are excellent, really good pastors Sunday morning right now preaching. They're changing their congregations. And then there's their prosperity pastors out there preaching. See, they're the modern day Pharaohs. They're the ones that are going, there is no God, but I'm going to teach you about Him. I'm going to teach you about Him because I want things. I want things. I could care less about this congregation. I want it for me. That's what's being taught today in church. Does that remind you of Pharaoh, the way he talked to his people and the Israelites? You guys, your God's not going to come and help you. There isn't one. How can you pray to him? Well, Pharaoh for a little bit changed his mind when he held his dead son because of the plague that God sent to kill the firstborns. Pharaoh, for that little bit of time, there's a story here. For that little bit of time, Pharaoh changed his mind. Go tell your God, free. Go tell your God you're free. Let them pack up and go. I don't ever want to see them again. I lost my son. You go tell him to lift all these plagues. You guys are free to go. But just like a modern day Pharaoh, God is out of sight, out of mind with people. Because as soon as Pharaoh had a minute to get his bearings back, he decided that he's going to take vengeance on God and his people. So he chased them down into the wilderness towards the Red Sea, thinking, ha ha, now what's your God going to do? As a fiery tornado came from the sky and stopped his chariots, then it was lifted. Moses takes his staff, jabs it into the, the land. The Red Sea opens. They part. Pharaoh, being not very intelligent, he must have went to Duke. Um, oh, yeah. Great Sunday. Yesterday, the University of North Carolina beat Duke at Duke during their senior night. <laughs> Pharaoh, in his ignorance, decides, well, Moses parted the Red Sea, we'll cross it too. But what Pharaoh still failed to realize, all these plagues, all the death, everything that went on prior to that moment, he's done forgot about. Out of sight, out of mind. They try to pass the Red Sea, what happens? God goes, you're really trying me? God, God's like, I mean, he's up there probably going, what's this guy really, what's he doing? All right, just close it. Boom. Now his whole army's dead. They drowned. But before, most of them probably didn't drown. Could you imagine millions of pounds of water just coming, pouring down on you all at one time? You're probably killed instantly. And how do I believe that story? Sounds kind of far-fetched like a science fiction movie, doesn't it? Well, it just so happens about seven years ago at the Gulf of Aqaba, 
at the Red Sea. Some archaeologists dove into the Red Sea. And at the bottom, guess what they found? They found the chariots everywhere. And how did they know they were Pharaoh's? Because Pharaoh and all of the people at that time took explicit notes and wrote explicit guidelines on everything. Pharaoh's warriors had specific wheels. They had a specific size. They had specific spokes. They matched those records towards what was found at the Gulf of Aqaba underneath the Red Sea. And guess what happened? You're not going to believe this one. They matched. They didn't kind of match. They were identical. So you can't tell me that God isn't God, that God is almighty, that God is all-powerful, that God can do anything good, bad, or indifferent by your thought process. Do we think it was good that he killed Pharaoh's army? It was good enough for God, it's good enough for me. He's got his reasons. Is God going to change your life just like that? Affirmatively, I tell you. Yes. He will. As long as you keep your faith. You can't have, I've been in a bad mood all week. Or a month. You can't really have, I've been in a bad mood all day. You know what you do when you're in a bad mood? You just think about something good that's happened. You think about a blessing that you have. If you have kids, think about the blessing. They're not hurt. They're not dead. They're not injured. They're not sick. We know that little girl has leukemia. Pray for her, but also pray that it's not one of your children because of God's blessing. But pray that God touches that family and that little girl to heal her. Amen? Pray that that's not you because I'm telling you something. It can be. God has been known to use people as a lesson. Because He wants glorified at all times. He wants praise. He wants everybody to go to Him. I personally think, and and I've told uh, Cynthia and Kelsey Lane this for weeks now, I personally think I am in the season of my greatest deliverance that I have ever had in my whole career of ministry. Everything that's going on right now in my life seems to be going perfectly. It seems to be lining up exactly what I believed God would do 10 years ago. Through 10 years of struggle, through 10 years of you know, heart attack, and 10 years of bad health, 10 years of just whatever. I believe this is... Actually, I don't believe it. I know it. This is the season that God chose for me and my family. And that I believe in wholeheartedly. And I hope that in your hearts, you believe that this season is the season that God's going to deliver you from everything that you have in your life. And if you don't believe that, there's an easy way to make that happen. Pray. When Austin and and the outlaws come up here to praise the music, remember, music is what won favor for King David to God. It was his poetry. It was his music. It was his harp. It was his praise. Some people like me, you know, the Bible says that God likes a cheerful noise. Some people say I should sing, and I have to tell them this. It says cheerful noise. It it doesn't say excruciating, you're going to make your ears bleed kind of noise. I can't do it. But we should praise. When they get up here, we should be the loudest church in the county singing back at him. Because God says, and he proved it through King David, music is a, is a key to God's soul. We should get up here, we should praise and worship with them. we should get in the body of Christ through this music, and we should appreciate the fact that uh, we actually have a pretty daggum good music team here. I want you guys to end with this today. If there's anything in your life that you want, nine weeks now, nine weeks, make God smile. Do the unexpected. Pray. Build your faith. I believe 
change is coming in a very magnificent way. I believe that this is the season of reconciliation for a lot of people. I believe that this is the season of prosperity and bounty. I absolutely, actually, I don't believe it. I know it. I know it is. So accept it. Just accept what God is going to do in your lives today. Accept that God is going to do abundantly more than you could ever imagine. Accept that. And for the people in here right now, you know I'm a very blunt person. And I'm just going to say this, and if I alienate people, that's just too bad. There's this thing, I think, it might have been Vicki. It might have been Leanne. It was someone that put, I hate walking into the store and getting a secondhand high because of all the marijuana smoke. Was that you, Vicki? Yeah. I'm going to say this about those people. I remember a day when you could walk into the grocery store and there were ashtrays at the end of aisles for smokers. People complained so much that they passed laws that you couldn't smoke inside the stores and so forth. Those same laws need to be passed for that. But I've also seen, personally, men and women getting out of vehicles, when they open the door, there's still smoke basically coming out of them. And the smell of skunk is so bad that I want to move my car to go someplace else. If you don't think that marijuana is a drug, you're wrong. It's prescribed if you need it. It's called a pill. They will actually prescribe it for you for glaucoma, arthritis, and other things. I don't want to walk into Walmart or to a grocery store and leave with that clinging to my clothes. But more importantly, what I started this off with was this. If you don't want your children growing up smelling like that, acting like that, and then doing that, you have to be the one to stop it. Because if you don't, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. Right? It's legal. I can't tell you not to do it. I'm just going to tell you. We're up here to change the world, right? We're up here to make this all better. We're here to make this next generation far greater than we are. Take some responsibility to your children. If you love them, take responsibility for them. And teach them the right way. Make them respectful so they don't grow up like we did. Because it's not been good, right? Amen? And I'm not alienating anybody. That's my point of view. I hope it touches somebody's heart. And if God was here right now, very loudly he would say, Cowboy up! Cowboy up!